Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session. We'll start with a, a talk by Kim Jels. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much um, for the introduction um, and also, well, obviously, for, I mean, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I've never been to Finland before, um, so I'm really enjoying it and also all the talks here. So I guess what I'm trying to do in my talk today is bring together um, the different places in my group where we use machine learning. Um, as I said this morning, I'm also more from the background of being a computational chemist, but much as Adam mentioned, we're recognising where there's really opportunities to use machine learning, particularly because you can sort of incorporate more of the complexity of um, what's really happening in experiment in ways that's really hard to do um, from computational simulations um, alone. Um, and also, as I mentioned this morning, this is something we're trying to do increasingly um, at my institution at Imperial College in London, um, and in particular in chemistry with our institute, Digifab. So um, picking out the different bits of things we're doing in machine learning, it, I, I hope I've weaved this into a bit of a narrative. And the real focus is how we can work really closely with experimental colleagues um, and make sure that our predictions are really beneficial to their experimental programs. nearer of course it worked two minutes ago and no, i won't i'll just come down it's better because then i won't fall off the stage either here we go right yeah so broadly speaking um i work within supramolecular materials so a lot of host guest binding systems but generally with materials that are built primarily from organic building blocks um and so that includes the types of materials that we have here um, in order to sort of weave a story, I'm going to focus mostly on the porous molecular materials, purely because these are the systems we've been working with the longest. In fact, I started working on them when I was a postdoc within the experimental group of Andy Cooper at the University of Liverpool. And then we have other representation from Liverpool in the posters here. Um, but that's as well where I got inspired as a computational researcher to really understand the perspective of the experimental researcher because I was embedded in the experimental groups um, for several years. So I'll focus mostly on the porous molecular materials and I'll introduce them more in a moment. I'll talk a little bit later about what we do in the work of porous polymers, particularly looking at membranes that can be used for some separations, um, including um, separations sort of iron selective separations, these sorts of things in slow batteries and those types of materials. I generally try to steer clear of metals as much as I can, but we do a little bit with metal coordination cages and also MOFs, but only, I guess, a sort of separate stream of our research is a real interest in structure prediction as well. Um, and with the porous polymers and the MOFs, we look at the how to do, predict structure when you've got amorphous systems. So within MOFs, really, the only focus it has been to look at amorphous MOF materials and their structure prediction, but that's something I won't talk about today. And then again, a separate uh, stream of research that I won't talk about quite so much, but, but that we are really interested in, and we're trying to apply the same approaches there, is in the area of organic electronics and semiconductors um, and so on. And again, it sort of relates back to a real interest in the structure prediction property, um, type approaches to like to predict the structure of organic or polymeric um, systems in the solid state and relate that to their properties in particular, sort of exploring the relationship between packing property um, and energy. Um, and I wanted to get this acknowledgement um, really up in front, and that's with particularly uh, long-term collaborator, uh, Dr. Becky Greenaway, who I, um, about three years ago, persuaded to move to Imperial College, so she has no choice but to collaborate with me even more. But we have worked together now for sort of more like a decade, um, and she does experimental research and, and focus also on automation. And we've been working really hard together to integrate our research programs a lot. We have a lot of shared students and so on. So um, students from her group use, learn a bit of simulation or AI, and then people from my group sometimes also go in the lab or help with coding up um, the automated platforms that they have. And we've written a couple of sort of uh, review papers highlighting um, our work but yeah so a lot of this depends on Becky and to be frank a lot of Becky's patience over many years um, with putting up with our predictions coming from the computer that weren't necessarily that useful but working together has um, really helped us move that forward I think. And here again, I won't, I won't dwell long on this because everyone understands these points, but because what we really want to do in my group as computational researchers is to be getting ahead, not just post-rationalizing what's been observed from experiment, but getting ahead and making prediction. And sort of 
really think we've got two key challenges there. One is um, the space, the enormous search base we have. So if I'm particularly looking at organic uh, based materials, then it's, it's an enormous search base of possibilities of materials that are built from small organic building blocks. And if we use numbers that have more been estimated for sort of small organic molecules for drug discovery, but uh, it's estimated up to sort of 15 non-hydrogen atoms, you get to something like 10 to the 60 possibilities when you enumerate out that space, the different ways you can form rings, different heteroatoms and so on. So it's a 10 to 60 search base. Um, and it's estimated that maybe humankind has made about 10 to 8 of these ever of these sort of small organic molecules and even 10 to the 8 is more than there are atoms in our solar system so it's an enormous number and how do we efficiently effectively search that space for what might be sort of needles in the haystack of the organic molecules that are really promising building blocks for materials um, and then secondly particularly for the organic materials um, we have the problem of the difficulty of the unpredictable assembly so organic molecules are not like buildings. So here I have an example of Imperial College's new uh, White City campus in the west of London, uh, which is where the chemistry department is based. That was a design sort of 10 years ago. Now this is the campus, the chemistry department is the white building that's along the railway line in the middle. And by and large, it's as per design. You can draw a sketch and end up largely speaking with your um, buildings that have the function you want. They're sort of rotated 90 degrees compared to the image in that photo. But, but we have that level of control at that level um, that we just cannot achieve at a molecular level. So it makes it really hard to do any kind of inverse design, I think, because if you will have your properties that you want in an organic material, you've got that problem of when you've got the organic molecule, it, it can assemble in quite unpredictable ways or hard to predict ways. And that can be very sensitive to very subtle changes in the molecule. Um, so it's really hard, it's, you know, a molecule is not like a Lego building brick for you to easily go from the molecule to a designed assembly that you want. And that makes inverse design really difficult because of that uh, hard to control assembly step in the middle. So now, um, just to give a very short bit of background on the porous molecular materials that I'm going to be talking about a lot. So unlike things like zeolites and moths, these don't have um, chemical bonding in three dimensions. Um, and instead, they are made up of discrete molecules that somehow uh, allow you to have porosity in the solid state. And this is basically a very rare feature. Most molecules will try to pack very efficiently nature abhors a vacuum and you can however get porosity by a couple of routes so first you have extrinsic porosity um, such as we're showing at the top so that's where you the molecules just cannot completely pack efficiently so that they leave voids between them classic example of this is dionese compound at top right um, discovered in the 1960s and it packs such that it leaves those one-dimensional hourglass shape um, channels between them and they're big enough to host very small um, gases like hydrogen but they're still not that large and that molecule was termed an organic zeolite by Barra who's the sort of grandfather of zeolite chemistry um, but from, for a long time really the surface area of these types of systems was really small sort of 400 meters squared per gram was considered pretty good but there's been a lot in the last 20 years of more increased research interest in these and particularly in getting porosity via intrinsic porosity as I've got at the bottom where the molecules themselves have some sort of um, internal cavity um, and a, a record holder comes from Michael Maslert's group in Germany of this boronate cage that has a very large surface area of over 3,700 meters squared per gram. Um, and of course, uh, high porosity per se doesn't necessarily imply uh, that much function, but uh, in terms of applications, these are particularly looked at for separation applications, which is quite niche separation applications. Um, but because the voids and the windows within them are very similar in size to that of small molecules, you have the potential to do separations that well. That way you can also do sensing and catalysis. Um, and also in some research, particularly um, from Stuart James's group at the um, Queen's University Belfast, um, they've been able to um, functionalize these cages such that they are um, liquid at room temperature whilst also porous. And that there's a really, really intense uh, research interest in these types of materials as porous liquids. So obviously there you might have some new sort of technology options by having sort of permanently porous sorbent that is also liquid. 
But to sort of set up how we were trying to be able to screen these type of systems, I wanted to de describe the underlying structures of these intrinsically porous molecules that have been our focus that we also call cages. So these have an underlying topology, much like you would with a network structure, but here we, our topology is generally going to relate, relate to some sort of platonic type um, solids or some polyhedra. In this example, we have an octahedron, and you can think of replacing each of the four coordinated vertices um, with a four coordinate uh, or <laughs> tetratopic molecule, in this case, for example, a tetraaldehyde. And then each of the edges, which are purple, with a diamine. Uh, and then the idea is that, in theory, you could react them together to get this highly sort of beautiful symmetrical structure. And I've chosen that type of chemistry deliberately. This is an imine condensation chemistry, which is reversible. Um, and that's what gives you the opportunity to have um, that symmetric structure that potentially is a thermodynamic product of the reaction rather than otherwise if you just got a set of oligomers or the original intention when someone first made these type of systems was actually to make a polymer, but someone sort of saw that there was a crystal and bothered to do um, the, uh, to get the crystal structure and found that they'd made these sort of porous symmetric structures. But the reversible chemistry is key experimentally, but also quite useful from a computational perspective if we wanted to predict the reaction outcome. Because in theory, you could get different topologies even with the same connectivity. Um, and we, if, we, if you're getting the lowest energy outcome, obviously computationally, it's easier to predict that because you can compare the energy of your different reaction outcomes and predict that um, they're most likely experimentally to realize the lowest energy um, topology. So if I... Um, we'll just talk you through what you'd ideally want to be able to predict from a structure, predict, uh, structure prediction perspective from these. So the goal is to just from a ChemDoor structure or just a SMILES code of your precursors to be able to predict the structure. And that's got a few levels. So first of all, it's predicting the topology, um, as I just mentioned. And here I've got a classic example of how difficult it is for these types of systems. So um, we've got two different topologies here. They both are molecules made from the same tritopic aldehyde, but they just differ in the diamine um, as shown there. So the one on the left using a cyclopentane diamine in purple, you get a four plus six reaction of four of the aldehydes and six of the diamines um, to form that structure that was highly porous over 1000 meters square per gram. And in fact, it was a record holder when it was made about 10 years ago. By contrast, if someone thought, oh, that's great, I'll do the same thing with just one extra CH2 group. By contrast, they then got a, a molecule that was double the molecular mass and a different topology, as you can see there, also um, a different shape. So that was a really subtle change. And you can hopefully see that that's not sort of chemically intuitive, that the human brain can already work out that you're going to get that difference. So that was something um, that we tried to predict uh, a lot by trying to look at the different energies of the different outcomes. Although it's really hard because this is happening in solution and solvent scaffolding can have a lot of effect. Now, the worst thing about the molecule on the right hand side was, in fact, that's not porous at all. And obviously, the intention in making that system was to make a porous system um, and a postdoc spent two years making and characterizing that system only to find that it wasn't porous so that was a lot of wasted time and why we were interested in being able to predict this computationally and that problem relates to um, shape persistence so shape persistence is a feature whereby the molecule maintains an internal intrinsic cavity even when you haven't got any solvent present so what you want is these shape persistence systems that are porous as if they're inflated by balloons and not sort of collapsed as we have on the right hand side and this is a, a very rare feature say 95% of the systems made collapse and are, and are not shape persistence. But for us, it's very, uh, computationally, it's actually pretty easy to predict this. We just run a molecular dynamic simulation with a force field, um, and you can sort of see whether the lowest energy conformation is open or not. That's where that, that's something that we can quite simply see that uh, from a simulation, although predicting the topology is much harder because maybe small influences of solvent in the reaction solution are affecting what topology you get. And then finally, if you're looking at properties in the solid state, then you also would need to predict the structure in the solid state. And this is, again, obviously quite challenging. So we can do this. Um, have some nice papers from some time ago um, where um, Graham Day in particular, who's at Southampton in the UK, used crystal structure prediction techniques like you normally use for pharmaceutical polymorphs or smaller organic molecules. You essentially, you know, come up with thousands and thousands of test structures, compare their energies using a sort of DFT with a dispersion, good dispersion correction, and you can sort of accurately predict these. Similarly, we can do a, a, a sort of annealing approach to predict how they would pack amorphously, which may be relevant if you're using them in membranes. 
Um, so you can do that, but the problem is it's, it's really computation expensive, uh, although they're working really hard on improving that and in part using machine learning for the sort of energy prediction and so on to make that cheaper. Um, realistically, we'd still have to spend sort of a, at least a couple of months to predict the structure of one system. So from my perspective, if we want to screen very large numbers of systems, then that's going to be quite a barrier. But before I talk more about that, so we've built up the capability to do these different predictions um, over many years. And a few years ago, for the first time, we were able to tie this completely together, a workflow where we looked at molecular prediction, um, actually making it more complicated by having three precursors so that you had different options of two or three component molecular uh, assemblies, as well as then predicting the crystal structure and doing that alongside our experiment partner, um, in particular Becky here, who was doing the experiments guided by which ones we suggested were promising. Um, and then Graham's group also did the solid state structure prediction as well, which again, that was then realized and our crystallographer looked at the structures and showed that we had been able to pick up um, the structural packing features that were key. So we can pull all those things together, um, but it's certainly not trivial to do so. And the other part of the prediction workflow that we wanted to be able to do was property prediction. Um, and here, as I said, we, we can't routinely have a solid state structure if we're looking at a hypothetical system, it's too difficult. So we look to take advantage of the fact that these molecules are intrinsically um, modular. So we've got a schematic of their sort of packing at the top. So we've got this tetrahedral molecule, it's got four windows and quite a common packing mode is to pack with a, a each window aligned to another window of a neighboring cage so that you get a diamondoid pore network that's shown there in cyan. Um, and what we identified is that if you analyzed at the molecular level, you could really predict a lot of what was going to happen in the solid state because, for instance, um, you had the sort of main binding pocket that was the center of the cage. And even if you were thinking about diffusion, so for doing separations uh, in, a, in a column, something like this, then you had the key points because it was a diffusion through the window and then it was also the guests having to do a sort of turn in the middle of the cage. So we developed some software such as um, PyWindow written in Python is open source that analyzes the intrinsic void, it analyzes how many windows you've got, the size of the windows. Um, and it's also sort of um, runs quickly enough that you can do this over a molecular dynamics simulation so that you can look at the windows opening and closing, which is really important to consider. Indeed, the people that first reported one of these systems looked at its crystal structure and said it's not porous, because if you look at the window size, it shouldn't be big enough even to fit hydrogen and nitrogen in. But that's when you get the crystal structure at quite a low temperature. When you factor in the breathing motion, that system that they said wouldn't be porous even for hydrogen can in fact fit a xylene molecule through its window if you factor in the sort of breathing and thermal effects. So considering the dynamic motion of the systems is really important for us. And that's what we can do by using Pi Window to analyze MD simulations so that we can see um, the cage breathing. And then we've used that sort of molecular analysis approach to revisit databases of other ones uh, of this type of material and look at them for xenon krypton separation, using a whole load of molecular analysis, DFT calculations, metadynamic simulations to look at barriers to diffusion. Um, to identify other systems that should be tested for xenon krypton separation, such as water wheel that's on the far right here. And um, this is called water wheel, um, that molecule. And we found that also um, our prediction held true experimentally that that was promising for xenon krypton separation. Um, and a similar thing at the bottom is study looking at separations of xylene that we did sponsored by industry. So I promise I'm almost getting to the point where we can do some machine learning, but if you see these are systems that are relatively rare, there are only a couple of hundred out there um, in the literature, so we definitely didn't have large data sets to be immediately playing with. But part of what's given us the ability to do that is a key piece of software that was developed in my group, in particular by a really talented um, now software engineer, Lucas Takani, who developed this during his PhD, helped by a lot of other people in the group. So this software is called STK or the Supramolecular Toolkit. Um, and how this works is it automates the sort of assembly of the uh, structures for us and also can automate um, getting the properties. Um, so SDK can be fed the building blocks of um, a larger supramolecular material um, and then based on functions that describe how those building blocks should be combined can then build those models and it does some sort of confirmer searching to look for low energy structures um, and it can do that across a range of um, different structures like organic cages in different topologies, um, linear polymers, um, small molecules that are combinations of different building blocks 
and also do some coughs. Um, and in the sort of more recent version at the bottom, we've extended it working with experimental collaborators who are interested in extended it, extending it to their system. So we can now do various sort of metal, transition metal complexes, metal organic cages, um, rotaxanes, other host gas complexes. Um, and it's relatively easy to sort of extend by adding on a new function uh, to um, add a, a new class of um, underlying structure. Um, and then it can be linked up to um, property analysis as well. So we can use structural sort of porosity analysis that we're interested in in our group. Um, we can also do potentially electronic analysis for the sort of needs of having low cost. We tend to use Grimmer's GFN XDB, which it already integrates with the sort of getting electronic properties of things like um, organic polymers. Um, and I should say this, this, this source code is open source on GitHub there. It's written in Python and makes heavy use of RDKit. Um, and we have some YouTube tutorials and a Discord channel, et cetera, all for helping people get started with it. Um, and I should say it also includes an evolutionary algorithm that helps us search um, the phase space as well, although that um, isn't something I'm going to focus on today. So in terms of machine learning, though, SDK gives us this possibility for these type of systems to just automatically generate large amounts of computational data for these um, types of systems. Um, and this was one early example with collaborators, um, Liam and Martine at UCL, just across London. Um, and they used SDK to allow them to do um, AI within um, organic polymers. They were interested in these their optoelectronic properties and also potentially sort of um, for photocatalysis. So um, what Liam did was to use SDK to um, generate 350,000 different linear organic polymers. Um, and then he calibrated GFN XTB against DFT to sort of get reliable IP and EA um, values. And then he was able to use a neural network um, to be able to make that prediction on new systems in the future because he had that large data set of the 350,000 molecules um, that had automatically been characterized via using SDK. And of course, at that point, that's also a really large data set. This is an, another example of a system where really there were tens of example, uh, examples in the literature from experiments. So people could make sort of structure property relationship trends suggestions, but obviously having that large data set means you could drill down and, and, and really look into that in more detail as well. Um, so going back to the organic cages, Having the ability to use SDK to generate computational data sets that we could use for machine learning meant we revisited this old problem of predicting shape persistence. As I said, that was something that we could do quite simply by just running a short MD simulation using a force field. Um, but not every group has access to that. We tend to use OPLS, a commercial force field, because broad applicability across sort of organic chemistry. Um, but experimental groups don't typically have that in-house. And so we thought if we build a machine learning model, the advantage is that experimental researchers can potentially access that without having um, to have the computational chemistry equipment analysis. So we were trying um, to help with this specific prediction of if I have a pair of precursors, will they form an open porous molecule that's shape persistent or will they collapse? So we used SDK to generate 60,000 cages as the training data. We did that across a range of different reaction chemistries for their formation and across a range of different um, topologies. And we just then did sort of bog standard supervised machine learning. We found that there wasn't much difference in their performance. That, and in the end, we used random forest generally um, for this prediction and for our model. And we found that we have really pretty good accuracy within class. And by that, I mean that if you have something for a tetrahedron, it won't translate well to a cubic topology. But that we would also expect from having seen how sensitive those things are experimentally as well. And of course, here we, we made the code open source as well as our data that other people have since revisited and used for other things. Um, but in order to make it really accessible also for experimental researchers, we host this model um, on a website, SupraShare. Um, this is my cage porous model. So an experimental researcher can just go there and just put in the smiles code of their two precursors they're considering, which they can get quite easily even, you know, you can get them from Wikipedia or something if you Google most molecules. So they just have to have the smiles code and then click a button and it will tell you the, the model's prediction as to whether um, something is porous or not. And we think this is really useful for whom, for people for whom trying to install Python or something would already be too much of a barrier um, to using our model. 
Um, and we have last year revisited that data set um, and Chi in my group looked at whether he could um, get better uh, performance on the predictions by using a graph neural network. And he did see some small um, gains in that by doing so. And he also um, tried to look a bit at what explainability we could get from those models by doing an integrated gradient approach where we could see different fragments relative contribution to the prediction of collapse or not. And as is sort of highlighted in, in this um, slide, the, the atoms colored red are the ones that are contributing um, more to the collapse of um, the model for, for various predictions. So I think that's something we want to start to be looking at a bit more as we talked about on the panel as well, like getting explainability from your models is not only desirable, it's also I think more satisfying as well as a scientist. Um, and then next I wanted to talk about something that's been a real key uh, theme of research in my group, which is, can we predict materials that can be synthesized? Um, and this is something we reviewed a couple of years ago and thought about it both from in inorganic materials and organic materials. And I think my interest there particularly was sparked from working in an experimental group, but realizing in general that we could predict, in, in, in my case, these organic molecules now, sometimes thousands of molecules a day that we think are promising, um, but it's kind of irrelevant if my experimental colleague Becky or someone will look at them and just immediately say, well, I can't make any of these, or they're just ridiculous, they're dangerous to make, etc. Um, so that's one part of the challenge that we reviewed in, in this article, the sort of various stages, particularly at the bottom for organic materials that you have there, not only can you purchase precursors that are easily synthesizable, can you form the desired molecule in our case? Um, will the reaction work? It, it often does it. It only works in the minority of cases for this sort of systems we're looking at. And then also, can you formulate the material into, what, into whatever form is needed for its application? For instance, can you cast it into a membrane? Is it soluble? But I will focus um, now on what we've done in that one specific case of how difficult are the precursors to synthesize or purchase. So, to explain, this is an example of output from using SDK as an evolutionary algorithm, where we have 15 different molecules, five from three different separate runs of the algorithm, um, that it has suggested are promising when we were targeting a specific size large, large pore. Now, the precursor library that we used for SDK in this case um, was Reaxis. So this is a library of previously reported organic molecules. So at the least, we thought it's good. They can be synthesized because their synthesis has been reported at some point. But of course, because they can be synthesized doesn't mean they're easy to synthesize or that they would be suitable for use in sort of a material that you might want to be um, relatively cheap. And even downloading and getting that sort of Reaxis database caused all sorts of problems. Um, the owners of Reaxis suggested cutting off the entirety of Imperial from use of Reaxis in the future because they thought we were doing something really nefarious. So like, trying to get more data out of Reaxis, like reaction steps, et cetera, um, wasn't a trivial um, thing for us to do. But what I want you to take from this um, is that the molecules we were predicting were sort of overly synthetically complicated. On the right hand side is the most common tritopic building block that we would see. Um, and already that's more complicated than necessary because it, it has this, each of the central rings have got functionalization that's not, not bringing anything to the party, so to speak, but making synthesis more complicated. And all of the vertices have got a lot of sort of periphery coming off them that would be synthetically difficult and costly to make, but don't add anything if you're just looking um, at getting a certain pore size. So synthetically, these were really, really difficult to make. And quite clearly, what you can do is just simplify them. But we wanted a way to sort of be able to have in as part of what we're optimizing in a multivariable optimization, something that relates to the synthetic ease. And what we wanted to stop having to do was giving my colleague Becky big lists of hundreds of possible molecules and getting her to look through them and sift for the ones she did actually um, want to make. Um, and so the way we went about this in the end, because we tried some of the sort of existing algorithms out there for synthetic um, complexity and found that they generally and didn't work for our particular problem. They've been developed for uh, other means. So instead, we decided to build a machine learning model that would predict whether or not um, a molecule was easy to synthesize. And we did that by collecting for ourselves that training data. 
Um, and because we needed thousands of data points, we found in the end that really only our experimental collaborators would sit there with patients to do that um, training data for us. And, and we got that by setting up an app that would just show them an organic molecule and ask this question of, can you make one gram of this compound in under five steps? And they would just click on that, yes, and sure, no. So it's rather like some other apps you can think of where you're swiping left and right, et cetera, but the equivalent for molecules. And so once we had that data and we were asking them to sort of go on quite quick gut instinct, because that's frankly all the time we could get them to commit to. Um, but then we were able to take that data and just train a supervised machine learning model that would make that prediction of whether something was going to be easy to make or not. And now we use that again in our SDK algorithm with the evolutionary algorithm. And this is an example of the output systems that we get, which even if none of us are organic synthetic chemists, hopefully you can see that these are relatively simple molecules. They're quite highly symmetric um, that would be easy um, to synthesize and access. And then this is Stephen who did that machine learning model prediction. And he has now gone into the lab and is trying to make some of these systems on automated platforms as well. Um, that, that he predicted. Um, well, it's an interesting workflow anyway, and he's really been enjoying that um, and really loved as well doing the coding aspect of interacting with the automated platforms um, in Python as well. Um, and this is the sort of workflow of what he's been working on. So he's trying to look at the different reaction conditions to try and increase the chance that he can find the sweet spot where these materials can be synthesized and also automating a lot of the analysis of the mass spec um, and NMR and so on by using scripting and potentially sort of some um, machine learning will be brought into that as well, as well as, of course, we're trying to move towards using more active learning to find um, the search bases we should be in. Yeah, I forgot that is a movie that's showing the report. But... Um, and I know I'm basically um, pretty much up with time, but I'll just highlight a couple of other areas beyond cages where we've used machine learning in slightly different ways. So as I said before, we look quite a lot at polymer membranes for separations and her focus has been on, um, is that how long I can talk or just how long you want me to stop? To talk? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I didn't know if, if you want to use that for questions, I can just stop as well. Yeah, so generally we do structure prediction, computational chemistry structure prediction of polymers, use that to help understand what they're seeing experimentally. And normally our experimental colleagues are saying, oh, we think the reason this separation is working is because of X, Y, and Z. We build a model and tell them that they're wrong and that's not what's happening. And that's sort of been how that's been working um, because it's quite hard to get structure property relationships for these sort of amorphous systems. And they're polymer chains that are by design pack very poorly. So we would obviously like to be able to get ahead and do machine learning here. Again, getting high quality large data sets is quite difficult, uh, but there is this online database um, from the Membrane Society of Australasia that had lots of gas separation data for membranes, but it was incomplete. You'd, get, you'd have data from some gases, but not from others. And so what she did was to use machine learning uh, for imputation where you, um, you start with some database that's missing points, but use um, various different options, so Bayesian linear regression and so on, as approaches to fill in database by working on one column at a time. So you guess initial values, then you focus on improving the prediction for oxygen, then for nitrogen, um, and so on. And this is only to show that um, the predictions were relatively good. Which algorithm worked best would depend on the exact problem you're doing, whether you were doing it from a sort of high data point or if you had sparse data. Um, and I knew I wouldn't have time to go into that in detail, but I think that's an interesting other simple way we could take incomplete databases, use machine learning to impute them, either look again for where there were missed opportunities. So historical material systems, in this case, polymers that were maybe not fully characterized. And so someone didn't realize that they were promising for a particular separation. We were able to identify some, but in our case, we found that the ones that looked interesting had been reported previously in the literature, but just had never made their way into a database. So I guess that's another story of the problem with data and machine learning too. Um, but we also can imagine using them whereby our experimental researchers just do one measurement that we know is typically high quality. So one particular gas like CO2, and then the machine learning model then predicts the separation with even hundreds of other um, gases so that you can identify the most promising places where the researchers should focus their 
further characterization on because individual gases can take even a week to measure one at a time. So I think it, uh, it's also very interesting there. And it showed up cases, for instance, methane was very unreliable for that sort of machine learning prediction, but it's also an experimental data point that our collaborators said is less reliable. And I will really zoom through just to say that we've also looked at um, using generative models um, and we focused on organic molecules with specific um, homo lumo and dipole properties. And because there wasn't a large enough data set, we used transfer learning. So first ta taught a recurrent neural network to produce smile strings by showing it Kemble, which is a big library of millions of organic molecules, more that's used for the drug discovery purposes. Um, but then showed it a small database of 200 organic molecules that had the necessary um, donor acceptor properties that we were looking at um, in order to have a specialized um, RNN that could sample and produce new systems. And the only thing I wanted to say on that is it just comes back to this point of uh, will the AI think differently to us? And in this case, what it had learned to do is what chemists, experimental chemists in that field do, which is to sort of swap oxygen and sulfur um, to add methyl groups and so on. And this is the nearest neighbor in the training set and then three of the promising molecules that the recurrent neural network had suggested that would have the right properties. So in this case, pretty quickly, in fact, it, it relearned the sort of rules that experimental researchers have learned for how you tweak and tune the properties in these systems. And with that, I will um, finish and apologize if I went slightly over and of course acknowledge my group. I hope to have mentioned the right people at the right time um, and also my funders. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Really, really nice. For this imputing, is there a validation step where they go and actually do the experiments based on what you're filling in? Because this sounds brilliant, us theorists filling in experimental databases. Yeah, so not yet. In that case, they didn't. But obviously, we did, you know, kept data aside and then could see um, how we were doing as you would do standardly. And that's, what I guess, what I whizzed through. And also was cheeky and showed a log plot. But it did a really good job of matching, even if you don't use a log plot. Um, it was doing a good job. And like I say, we, re we said, OK, this system should be looked at. And then when we looked in the literature, it was some that had been um, reported from a group at KAUST, but they'd never added that to the database. Um, and yeah, so and so our collaborators were quite keen that it does look interesting. And it, the fact that it, it found the same problems that methane is known to be very unreliable to get the experimental measurement, we found it very unreliable when doing sparse prediction. Yeah. But I think it's something that's interesting that that can be generally applied much more, I think, yeah. Okay, then we have a question from uh, Georgili Juhas that what is the greatest challenge to use similar approach for metal complexes, for example, cages or moths? Yeah, um, so to be honest, I generally steer clear of moths because within the poorest materials background, like community, which is where I'm from, almost everyone is doing moths. So I sort of made a decision um, to steer clear of moths. But where we've added in metal organic cages and so on, from our perspective, if we've got to generate the data computationally, it's that you have these force fields for organic systems that are transferable. Um, and it just adding in the metals makes it more difficult. Um, so that's a computational chemistry um, perspective. So it's not impossible, it just makes it a little bit more difficult. And we have done it for some systems now where we look at coordination cages that have the metals, but it makes it computationally more expensive for us, um, particularly if we're looking for low cost methods that allow us to get large data sets quickly. Um, so it's not that it's impossible, it's just slightly more difficult and also just my own intrinsic reasons of why I steer clear of metals. Uh, so let's thank Kim again. Our next talk is from uh, Venkat Kapil, a contributor talk. He's joining us from England, I think, online. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for yeah for allowing me to speak from here. I mean, unfortunately, I had some visa issues, uh, one of many since the last uh, two years. But 